Hello everyone, welcome to our Vestibular First Journal Club for May of 2023. And we have with us tonight a very wonderful guest, Dr. Jeffrey Sharon, um, who will give himself a further introduction for us. So uh, thanks, Elena. Um, yeah, my name is uh, Jeff Sharon. I am a neurotologist, um, meaning an ENT doctor who specializes in hearing imbalance disorders at uh, UCSF. Um, and I am also the director of the Balance and Falls Center there. Um, so I spend a lot of my time uh, seeing patients with vestibular disorders. And then I also um, try to do research into um, vestibular disorders and how we can make uh, care better for vestibular patients. Well, we definitely appreciate that. So <laughs> thank you. Keep that up. Uh, tonight we'll be talking about one article of many uh, that you have participated in. Uh, this particular article is on vestibular and auditory migraine symptoms. So we're going to get right to it because we have so much to cover on this topic uh, because it is quite the involved topic. So I always like to start out just very briefly getting everyone on the same page here. So first peripheral vestibular anatomy, what is the vestibular system? It's our inner ear balance sensor, I like to say. Uh, it is a neighbor to a lot of hearing structures. Um, so this is why we often kind of associate them together or might see problems that are happening at the same time with both of them sometimes. Um, and that lives kind of deep in our inner ear, so you can't really touch it unless you want to go into do surgery, which I know you have, but um, <laughs> the average person should not be touching their vestibular system. Uh, but it's in there doing a very important job on both sides, uh, typically in our inner ears. And then we have these connections from our inner, inner, inner ear balance sensor uh, via uh, one of the nerves uh, that kind of goes into the brain stem, kind of bottom part of our brain, and then lots of other connections that go all through the brain. So we want the inner ear balance sensor to connect to different parts of the brain because that information on balance and where we are in space should correlate and kind of be integrated with information from our eyes and the joints in our body and all these different kind of um, sensory inputs that help us orient ourselves and you know move about the world and so forth. And um, we're going to talk more specifically now about migraine. So I always like to start with kind of classic migraine, uh, which I have seen defined as a genetically influenced complex neurological disorder. Uh, and the typical migraine people think of is this kind of episodes of moderate to severe headache, um, considered to be most often unilateral, uh, often associated with nausea, sensitivity to light and or sound and it is the third highest cause for disability in the world, give or take. Um, anything else you want to add on kind of just what migraine is in a general sense before we go to the vestibular version, if you will? Yeah, um, and migraine is um, remarkably common. It's probably about one in 10 people, maybe more, have migraine. It's almost impossible to not know someone who has migraine. If you're in an elevator, probably someone in the elevator <laughs> suffers from migraines. It is, um, as you said, the third highest cause for disability. But if you look at disability among people in their working uh, mm. years, it's actually the highest cause um, for, for disability. Um, but there's a couple um, a misconceptions about migraine. And one of the most important ones that I'm sure we'll get into is that a lot of people think that migraine and a bad headache are synonyms. Mm. And, um, and if you don't have headaches, you can't have a migraine. Um, and that um, headache is the only symptom of a migraine. Um, and none of that's true. Um, a migraine is a neurologic disease that affects the brain um, in quite a few ways. And headache just happens to be the most common symptom um, but as I'm sure we'll get into in a second, uh, dizziness and vertigo are also very common symptoms of migraine um, that sometimes happen with a headache and sometimes without. 100%. No, I agree. It is a huge issue that um, patients <laughs> will come to me and flatly deny uh, both a personal history of uh, migraine and a family history of migraine. 
Uh, but if one is a little, a uh, little bit more clear about what that might look like, they're like, oh yeah, I have those symptoms. And oh yeah, my mom has that. And oh yeah, my grandma <laughs> always had that. It's like, okay, now we're getting somewhere here. Uh, I don't want to lead the witness, but you know, sometimes you do have to clarify, right? Um, oh, absolutely. You know, we're not, we're not taught about you know, the diagnostic criteria, most people on the street can't recite the International Headache Society criteria for the diagnosis of migraine. But migraine is an interesting one. It's one of the few disorders where self-diagnosis is remarkably accurate. So if someone thinks they have migraine, it's, it's an over 95% chance that they actually would be diagnosed by a neurologist um, with migraine. Um, some, uh, but there's a lot of uh, misconceptions out there again um, a, a lot of people probably had migraine and vestibular migraine who didn't fully realize it and a lot of those cases were either told that they had vertigo or Meniere's or BPPV mm -hmm. um, and when you dig deeper under the surface you find out that the phenotype meaning what what the symptoms actually look like was far more likely to be vestibular migraine than, than those conditions. 100%. No, and I think that leads us right to this slide. So vestibular migraine is considered a, a kind of a variant or a flavor of migraine that's going to have some vestibular symptoms as you're describing with or without headache. Either way, um, you can see it. And again, they often, although not always, have a light sensitivity and or a sound sensitivity um, maybe just more of a sense of pressure. We're going to talk about kind of how sinuses, people kind of <laughs> to consider all sinus problems. It actually could be, some of them could be migraine. Um, and uh, motion sensitivity is a common co-report. Um, and so you kind of hit on some of the numbers of general migraine. Here are some specifically. Uh, including average age of onset. But I will say, and I'm sure we could go a whole nother hour on pediatric migraine and benign uh, paroxysmal vertigo of childhood. But be that as it may, we will not. But enough to say that um, you're probably aware, I'm sure, of the literature of, you know, kind of some, even though the average age of onset here is, is you know, 37 for females, 42 for males, um, there are certainly some early cues and indicators sometimes that a person might be headed towards an adulthood of migraine um, with those kind of earlier symptoms of kind of random onset of vertigo um, that has that long name I already said. <laughs> yeah, I think that's an excellent point and I do always like to remind people because sometimes when I try to explain the strong connection between dizziness and migraine, um, sometimes there's skepticism and I try to explain like I think we have it all back backwards right <laughs> the first migraine manifestation in the human life cycle is not a headache mm -hmm. it's little kids you know two four six years old who are getting vertigo and later in life they then uh, go on to develop headache to me that's a sign that vertigo and migraine are strongly connected in in profound ways, um, mm -hmm. and that's why it comes out so early in life. A hundred percent, and some abdominal complaints, which I'm sure, um, you know, they're still researching that kind of possible link. I think, but uh, you know, I'll just you know, it's interesting. Like you you learn about these things, and then you're like, oh, and my niece, you know, she definitely fit that pattern for whatever it's worth. You know, she had those kind of you know, GI issues as a, as a baby, and now she's got these kind of like aura type stuff, but not really true, you know, significant headaches. And she's a teenager, just about to be 13. And now, you know what I mean? Like, I think, you know, not to, to try to set her up for that, but I've just kind of, I've already educated my sister to keep an eye, you know, and, and not to be surprised because unfortunately her primary care physician uh, was not, oh, you know, maybe, you know, of course it's good to rule out tumors, Always want to roll out the brain tumor, but you know, <laughs> after that, right? It, yeah, it is. It, it's shocking how common migraine, different migraine symptoms are, you know. And and uh, I don't know that uh, that was really taught to me in medical school. Just how many of my patients coming through the door 
every single day would have some type of a migraine symptom. And um, it's, you know, I think about like, I grew up on these TV shows like House MD, where he's like, diagnosing all these rare conditions <laughs> if that tv show was true to life he'd basically be diagnosing migraine in half the episodes <laughs> for correct. all the different <laughs> symptoms that people are coming in for yes but that would have gotten way too boring so they definitely stuck to the different rare diagnosis every time right all right so you mentioned the criteria i had to put them up for everybody so these are the kind of the official current uh, vestibular migraine criteria and there is another uh, probable criteria that are a little more generous that I did not put up here as well, but um, they do exist because um, some people will get a little bit agitated. Oh, you know, my patient doesn't exactly fit this or they haven't had that many episodes. And I'm like, yet, um, you know, like, so it's like, you know, just to kind of be aware, it, it can be an evolving uh, diagnosis that might take a little time to, to develop confidence on. And one of the biggest issues that patients complain to me about is, well, isn't there just an image, oh, can't you take an x-ray, an MRI, and see that I have migraine? You want to speak to that for us? Yeah, um, so a couple points with that. The, the first point I want to make is that um, there's these criteria from the International Classification of Headache Disorders, or the ICHD, um, which just has the one category of a severe migraine, the ones available through the Baronet Society, which is an international group of vestibular researchers, has the vestibular migraine criteria, which are the same, or the probable vestibular migraine criteria. Right. I, um, I think actually the nomenclature of probable is a bit unfortunate because it makes people believe that it's not as real or as certain of a diagnosis as vestibular migraine. And I have to say, in my clinic, it's about half and half the, the quote unquote probable vestibular migraine or the vestibular migraine. And I don't view it as any less of a certain diagnosis. In my clinical experience over the last 10 years, I really haven't seen that those over time when I diagnosed that, it turned out in hindsight I was wrong and it was something else. Um, it really is, and they seem to respond to migraine medicines at the same rate as the definite, what used to be called definite vestibular migraine, now just called vestibular migraine. So um, uh, I think that the probable group is just a different flavor of mm -hmm. vestibular migraine. Um, I, I actually wrote a paper kind of nitpicking some things in the criteria, um, and I'm happy to go through um, <laughs> why, uh, why I feel that the criteria are good. Yeah. But I actually feel like there's a lot more patients who have a super migraine who aren't uh, covered by the current For criteria. Sure. Um, and the biggest group there is that the there are patients with chronic vestibular migraine. So the mm -hmm. same way we can have a chronic migraine headache. So you can have a migraine headache that lasts for five years. It's sad to say because it's a terrible, terrible condition, but it is true that that happens you can have the same thing with uh, a vestibular migraine. For sure. Um, so um, the last uh, point is is what you mentioned about the imaging or the MRI or the lab test. So this is a disorder that's diagnosed based on criteria. Um, and, you know, that that isn't ideal um, in some ways from a patient standpoint. Um, and it makes a lot of sense, right? If you're suffering terribly from a condition, um, you want a, a validation of a test being abnormal, right? And you want to be able to point to it and say, oh, you know, the doctor saw my problem. Um, they, they, they see it right there. It's very clear what's going on. Um, unfortunately, in medicine, we still have a lot of um, disorders that are diagnosed based on criteria. Um, it reflects most likely our inability at this point in time to image um, uh, um, kind of what's going on in the brain. So neural circuitry right. and, and not just the brain itself. So when yes. we get an MRI, it's really an anatomic scan and it's really looking for anatomic problems like strokes or brain tumors, kind of like structural problems. The analogy I always use is uh, 
our brain's a computer mm -hmm. and, and the MRI looks for hardware problems. But the pro but the issue with that is that many of the diseases we have are software problems. Yes. Um, and migraine probably fits a bit more into that category. And we don't have good ways of seeing that right now. Now, there is very interesting work um, being done with biomarkers for vestibular migraine. Um, and, um, you know, I have colleagues uh, like John Kerry at Johns Hopkins, mm -hmm. who's looking into CGRP, which I'm sure we'll talk about um, at some point tonight, which is a, uh, the neuroinflammatory peptide, that's a mouthful, but it just means a brain <laughs> chemical um, that gets released um, during migraine headaches. Um, and he's finding that um, the same brain chemical is uh, present at, in high levels in vestibular migraine. Mm. Um, so we might, um, but it's actually very hard to quantify. Yeah. Um, and, and you need specialized labs and it doesn't last that long. It degrades very quickly. Um, so it's a bit of a mess trying to measure levels, but in the future, we may have more biomarkers. Yeah, that'll be exciting. Keep pushing forward the science. I love it. All right, so we got to dig into this auditory piece because this is a big, uh, important piece of the article uh, that I think it, it can be tough to understand. So we talk about oral symptoms. That's so in the ear. We might have tinnitus or ringing, roaring, depends on how you want to describe that one and then kind of an oral pressure, they're common. And there's emerging evidence that hearing loss can be associated with migraine, and we get into that more a little bit later. And this is termed a cochlear migraine. So, um, you know, patients who uh, might have these symptoms, it's not a minority from, from the numbers that you have here in the paper. So 63% uh, with vestibular migraine, I mean specifically, can also have this ear pressure report during their vestibular migraine attacks. Um, and you also state in the article there that people with a history of vestibular migraine are three, tor three times excuse me, more likely to have cochlear disorders. Um, and this is kind of a, a series of symptoms, tinnitus, sudden deafness, and sensory neural hearing loss. Can you just define that last one for the group? Yeah, so um, those of us in, in hearing um, and hearing medicine divide hearing loss into two main categories. Um, so the two main categories, they're both mouthfuls. One is conductive hearing loss and one is sensory neural hearing loss. Um, so it's a big word, but it, it makes more sense if you break it down. Sensory means the organs in our body, the little biologic machines that actually sense things, right? So sensory in the sense of hearing means the cochlea, meaning the inner ear organ of hearing, the miraculous, you know, snail shaped object there deep in the is. skull. It's there blue. it is there um, <laughs> that takes incoming sound waves and then has uh, hair cells that based on uh, vibration senses those vibrations and turn them into nerve signals. So that's the sensory part. And then the neural part just means the nerve, right? And since we can actually distinguish well nerve problems from sensory problems, we just bundle it together in one word, which is sensory neural. So that means it's a problem with the cochlea, the hearing nerve. Um, Conductive hearing loss problems are problems with the sounds getting into the cochlea. So if you have a hole in your eardrum or the hearing bones are missing or something like that, um, then the sounds can't get in. So the cochlea might work just fine and the nerve might work just fine, but you still have a hearing loss because the sounds aren't being transmitted well inside. So that's called the conductive hearing loss. Right. And I would re be remiss, even though your art kind of just breezes a little bit over triggers. I would be remiss without mentioning triggers. And I wanted to mention triggers, not only because you do mention the most common vestibular triggers. This is directly from your article. I just made it into a bit of a bar graph for everyone. Um, so ranging from motion, which I think for, as a vestibular therapist this is not shocking that someone with any kind of vestibular problem would not love motion. Uh, stress, uh, everyone loves blaming stress, but it is a real thing, people. <laughs> it can trigger these symptoms. So the brain's working extra hard is what I like to say. And that could be both negative experiences, like things you're worried about, and positive things, like, oh, you know, my daughter's wedding's coming up. We have all these things to plan. It's very exciting, but there's also a lot that your brain is having to do. 
extra work for the brain. That's how I explain it. Um, busy visual environments or scenes. Um, some people really hate the grocery store for this reason or can't look at the person wearing the lined shirt. I actually only wear plain shirts for this reason at work. Uh, <laughs> and, um, scrolling on a screen just kind of fits that visual stimulation situation. Impaired sleep. And not on this list, but something that the patients mentioned to me with some regularity is weather. Can you speak to that one for me? Yeah. And... Um... I think that for this paper, we only got the top five. Um, we did take uh, 50 or so of our patients and gave them a pretty long list of um, different potential triggers and just had them say whether or not they thought that for them, uh, the specific thing was a trigger for their vestibular migraine attacks. Um, so weather is is definitely on there um it just wasn't as high as as these top five so it's it's but it's still present in a lot of patients um w i don't know why it happens you know in all honesty um there's some mechanism by which um we sense pressure changes and i, I don't know what it is physiologically um but it's so consistent that right? people are um bothered by it um, you know, humans don't, um, we don't directly sense, um, uh, barometric pressure. Um, but, um, but clearly there's some mechanism that we don't know about, um, going on here. Um, there are, you know, there are some birds, um, that actually do directly sense barometric pressure, uh, with an organ in their ears, um, called the paratympanic organ. And, um, and it stretches with, um, and it's fluid filled and it has hair cells, that's why it's in the ear, um, and contracts with different uh, pressures, ambient pressures. And that's how these, you know, long haul birds are able to travel through storms and night and clouds and things like that and maintain the same altitude um, as they sometimes circumnavigate the globe is, is due to their ears and being able to sense pressure. but. Um, so the bottom line is, I think it, it's real, um, but I don't fully understand uh, how we do it. Fair enough. Well, there it is. So believe yourself, those of you who <laughs> say, you know, I have a migraine when the weather changes. I have plenty of five patients who have to cancel therapy sometimes because of that. Anyway, I, I could not um, avoid, nor did I want to, mentioning this really cool assessment tool that you made. So that's what we get to talk about next. The vestibular migraine uh, patient assessment tool and handicap inventory. And the number one question I have about this right out the gate is, who do you want to use this? What's your kind of dream clinician? I assume it's for clinicians to provide to patients. So I guess that was a leap on my part. What do you think? Yeah, so... Um... First of all, uh, the name, um, we basically chose it because, um, and I pronounce it as Vempathy, and the idea was it's supposed to rhyme with empathy. Nice. Um, and that's why it has this whole weird, like, VM das pathy or whatever. But Got it. <laughs> uh, that, that's what I'm trying to get to catch on, is people call it Vempathy because it, it should um, sound like empathy. I love it. Um, so um, basically... Um, when I started uh, my career at UCSF um, and I chose to focus on vestibular migraine mostly because that seemed to be what all my patients had um, and it's just so common and it shocked me that for a disorder that is probably the most common cause of dizziness and vertigo in the world, um, we don't have almost any scientific data or good trials or good studies um, telling us which medicines are the best and which ones don't work. Um, so we decided, well, let's try and see if we could study this disease and change that and get better evidence. And one of the first problems we came across was that you can't study something unless you can quantify it, right? So I can't, especially for a disease that's di diagnosed based on criteria, if I can't put a number on somebody and then treat them and treat someone else. Did it get and better? Compare their numbers <laughs> before and after. Right. You know, it, it, this is simplistic, but it's totally true. I can't um, study them. Now, there are some ways to assess dizziness, like the dizziness handicap mm -hmm. inventory, 
But our feeling was that vestibular migraine patients have a lot of different symptoms mm -hmm. and not just dizziness. So our feeling was we don't just want a symptom based um, patient reported outcome measure is what they're called, PROMS. Uh, we wanted a, a disease specific outcome measure. Right. So we wanted a way to just count up the different symptoms that someone with vestibular migraine has and come up with a score. And then that way we could understand how well we're doing over time with treatment. Um, so we talked to a lot of patients, we talked to a lot of experts, we looked in the literature, and we came up with a list of different items that um, seem to be prevalent. And then we did a study uh, which looks at several properties of the scale to make sure that it's, it's valid, mm -hmm. it's reliable, that if you take the test a day later, you're not getting wildly different scores, that if you feel like you're taking treatment and that that's helping you, that your scores improve. Right. Um, and a bunch of like psychometric uh, properties. And, mm -hmm. you know, like any scale, I think it's, it's, it ended up being a very good way to measure, like it performed well on all these different assessments that we do. Um, there, uh, there, it could be that if you spent more time studying this, you could develop an even better scale. But for our purposes, we're finding that it, it functions pretty well. And um, since, um, and we're still continuing to study it. So since publishing it, we've done several more studies and we find that it does work pretty well as a scale. So if we treat someone and they feel overall like they're doing better, then um, their scores generally improve. Um, and um, we found, um, and this is very recent work that was just presented at uh, the our um, the American Neurotology meeting, which was just a meeting that was just held in Boston, these scores actually correlate very well with daily dizziness scores. So mm -hmm. we're doing a study where we're sending patients a text message every day asking them to rate their dizziness and uh, higher scores on that do correlate with higher scores on our metric, the of empathy. So we're finding out more and more things about it. Um, and we're, this is unpublished now, but we're working on a paper looking at what the minimal clinically important mm -hmm. difference is on this scale. So that's always an important number that people want to know. So if I get a, it's out of a hundred. So if I get a 42 and then later on you test me and I get a 41, does that matter? Right. Or is that just the random variations? Um, and it, it, I, I hesitate to say anything because it's not published yet, but it's looking <laughs> like that number's probably about six or so, but we'll see um, once we have the sure. final numbers. We'll watch for that. Awesome. That so, was a long okay. intro. So Let who do you want us? Question. Yes. Who's taking it? Yeah. I was getting to it. I apologize. <laughs> no, um, no. I just get very I, excited. <laughs> I'm a rambler. Um, so, You're doing great. <laughs> um, yeah. The... Um, the, so this is not, it's important to know, it's not a diagnostic tool. Mm -hmm. You know, we expect vestibular migraine to be diagnosed by um, a, um, a practitioner who um, knows uh, what they're doing and knows how to screen for other vestibular conditions. Because unfortunately, misdiagnosis is, yeah. is out there and it's common, right? So this is for people who have been told uh, by a vestibular uh, provider that they have uh, vestibular migraines. And I view it as it's a good way to track your symptoms over time mm -hmm. because, um, and, and also the second thing that's a big part that I use it for is it's a good way if you want to do research in vestibular migraines to be able to quantify um, patient symptoms and be able to track those over time and see if they're changing. But patients can use it by themselves. And th this is important because you know, you're always going to be your own best advocate. And if, if you're seeing um, someone who wants to try medications or physical therapy or some other treatment for you, I think it's a great idea to do the Vempathy before mm -hmm. and after and, and just try to keep track of what's helping and what's not helping. For sure. And I would say as a physical therapist, it's obviously not going to be the only thing I would check by any means, but I 
I think it's a nice add for especially someone walking in with a known diagnosis of vestibular migraine that I think is pretty trustworthy from the clinician that's you know sending them to me. Not to say that all clinicians are, are are not great, but you know some are just more familiar with vestibular migraine than others, as you say. So you know, um, then that can be just like one more little piece of information um, that could come in handy um, if I want them to retake it after a round of therapy and, and, or let them know that it exists in case they're like, Oh, I'm going to try a new med. I don't know. Just to, it was a good thing to be aware of. And I hope people will use it, um, in those ways for sure. So, um, I don't want to dig in too far to this because this could be a whole hour in and of itself. Uh, but I just couldn't address migraine without mentioning kind of the theories as to why it happens. So a big um, area of discussion is the trigeminal nerve, uh, which kind of um, serves the face, if you will, in general, and the head, um, which is why we might get pain with some migraines and lots of different neuropeptides, you know, kind of chemical signalers, if you will, um, that have a lot of different effects um, there's a whole cascade, if you will, of, I call it cranky brain. I'm just going to, you know, cap it off that way. You know, the brain is sensitive. It gets a stimulus it doesn't like. And it, like, you know, again, different people can be affected by different ones. Um, weather change, whatever it is, pushes them over the edge. And they kind of go into this um, state. And it may last, as you mentioned, or, and or become a kind of a chronic state, unfortunately, for some folks. Uh, and you already mentioned our friend, <laughs> Mr. CGRP. Um, so you've given us a good definition of that and the research that's going on, kind of seeing how it's um, kind of pretty pivotal in some ways to um, some pathways related to the inner ear. So um, they've talked about genetics with this. Um, you know, sometimes uh, people will say, I can't. I don't know of anyone in my family, but that just mean, it might mean you don't know. <laughs> so, you know, that's kind of like my bottom line. But, of course, somebody can have a genetic kind of reshuffling that they could be the uh, perhaps the first person in their family to have it. Would you say that's also true, Dr. Sharon? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, that's uh, definitely possible. We find it's probably about 70 or 80 percent of people with vestibular migraine have a, a known family history. Um, so it's it's certainly most, but not all. Awesome. Um, yeah, and then uh, you kind of mentioned how they're kind of doing research not only in treatment, but certainly in trying to sort out the finer points of, you know, why migraines happen. Because if we can know what's happening with the pathophysiology, that could help us potentially lead to more effective, more directed, more specific treatments, because certainly a frustration for some patients could be, well, I tried this thing, and it's supposed to work for people, but it didn't help me, right? Yeah, um, we need to do more studies. I fundamentally believe in the scientific method, and when I look at the migraine headache literature, you know, there are these beautiful review papers where they'll take, you know, the last you know, uh, 50 studies that are all high quality, well done, randomized clinical trials with a placebo and a drug, and and they'll be able to say the level of evidence for using different treatments and recommend, you know, this is a grade A recommendation and a grade B and et cetera. And then I look at vestibular migraine and we're still doing expert opinion. Yeah. Um, and, and it's because we just don't have the data and the studies. And um, I think that that um, uh, isn't ideal because most of the time when patients come in, yeah, they're interested in learning about the vestibular system and all this stuff, but at the end of the day, they just wanna feel better. And they wanna know, can you give me a treatment that's definitely gonna work? Um, and you know, the state of the art uh, sad to say, is is not that. The state of the art is trial and error, where yeah. I say, well, I have some things that have worked in some patients and have reasonable rationale, and I could tell you about the risks, and then we could try one, and if it doesn't work, we could try something else. And, um, and I think we have to do better, and that's mm -hmm. why it's really important to do studies, and that's why, um, from a patient perspective, 
um, I think it's important, if possible, to try to help with research because it's really a team game and a team effort. And I'm always so impressed by my patients. So, and they're just always willing to sign up for research because they realize that um, they're not, you know, we're, we're not alone in this. There's a whole community of people who suffer from the cyber migraine. And they really just want to do anything, not to just help themselves, but to help everyone else. Absolutely. Agreed. No. And, you know, a lot of what I understand to be some medications that could be tried, um, especially prophylactics, if you will, for vestibular migraine are essentially borrowed, uh, as I understand from kind of what you'll call the, the classical migraine treatments that have more support, um, which is what makes it tough because, you know, some you know, may not affect the dizziness at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, not the, you know, if they have also headache, great. If we could take that away, I'm not saying don't, but, um, <laughs> if dizziness is more the primary feature and there's not as much headache going on, um, that's a little trickier. Um, so that leads us to some other exciting treatments and, uh, and this could be again, a whole talk by itself, but uh, trigeminal nerve stimulation with the cephalia, I believe is one brand, vagal nerve stimulation, um, we want to speak to those at all? Um, yeah, I'll just mention that um, these are, there's a couple um, uh, different devices on the market in this neuromodulation category. So the idea of stimulating different nerves, um, sensory nerves or the vagus nerves or others um, to try to help with migraine activity. And there's pretty reasonable evidence that they help with um, migraine headaches. And as you mentioned, you know, people are familiar with uh, some of the more common ones like Cephali or Gamacor or Norivio. Um, and we really don't have evidence, um, it, meaning not evidence for and not evidence against um, that they're helpful for vestibular migraine symptoms. Um, they're just very small sc uh, sporadic case series. Um, so we really do need to um, study these devices more formally um, and find out if, um, if they're helpful. For sure, for sure. Um, and then uh, nutritional, there's a whole separate journal club if you're into learning more about this. Uh, we had with the Dizzy Cook, Alicia Wolf. Um, so, you know, feel free to watch that as well on our YouTube channel. Uh, but I just wanted to mention um, that it is important. Certainly magnesium is, uh, I think, the biggest or has the most literature, again, surrounding more on the headache side. But still, um, I figure it's always good to keep your vitamin levels at a, at a healthy level. You know, no need to overdose, but right? Uh, yeah, I would agree. Uh, yeah, again, you know, and uh, I'm going to sound like a broken record by the end of the night, <laughs> but I really do believe that we have to prove these things rather than yeah. assuming these things. Right. Um, it, you know, so we now are learning because the assumption was that any treatment that works for migraine headache probably works for vestibular migraine. And I think we're just now on the cusp of learning that that's not true. Um, and, and it makes sense, right? There are different diseases. Otherwise, you wouldn't get dizzy. You'd get a headache. They'd <laughs> right. be exactly the same. Um, and it seems like some of the treatments um, that are very effective for migraine headaches don't work that well or don't mm. always work for vestibular migraines. Um, so in that category um, it are triptan medications, mm -hmm. right? Um, so drugs like sumatriptan, erisotriptan, and there's a number of others um, seem to work very well in a lot of patients for migraine headaches. And there's great evidence that they're helpful. Um, at uh, the Baronet Society meeting last year, um, a, a group a, a announced results, a collaborative with UCLA and Mayo, um, that they did a study of trip dance for vestibular migraine, and they didn't find that it helped with symptoms at two hours. Uh -huh. um, so, and similarly, <clears throat> um, for migraine prevention, there's great evidence that beta blockers um, help prevent migraine headaches. Um, but a German group, there's a huge uh, vestibular group in Munich, um, published a study and they, it was terminated early, but they still had well over 100 patients randomized looking at a beta blocker for vestibular migraine and they didn't find significant treatment effects. So it is, <laughs> 
seeming to me, at least at this point in time, likely that uh, vestibular migraine is not the exact same thing as migraine headaches, and not every single migraine headache treatment is going to work great for vestibular migraine, meaning they each need to be independently evaluated with well done, um, high quality scientific studies. Sure. No, I think that makes perfect sense. Uh, not great for the person who has a vestibular migraine today, but hang in there, guys. We're going to keep doing our next best thing, right? Um, mm -hmm. Exercise is something I absolutely wanted to mention. Um, there is not, again, a ton of literature on physical therapy or vestibular rehab and or exercise um, that could really show us that we can knock out vestibular uh, migraine with specific um, you know, treatments per se. However, um, you know, there is some good evidence that exercise is a good idea and you should pace yourself. You got to start light. Um, and that's a whole guided situation that you might want to find a physical, physical therapist who's familiar with treating patients with vestibular migraine that can maybe help guide you through that. Um, but there's some promise that it might help, um, decrease frequency and severity of, of attacks. So, um, since I exercise, exercise is generally a good thing for us anyway, as long as it's not triggering severe migraines, in which case you probably need some medical management um, to the best of your ability first, and then again, starting on the lighter side, but otherwise uh, to build that up um, could be a really good benefit. Um, and people ask me a lot, what should I do? And my general rule of thumb is something you'll continue to do. <laughs> um, but if you wanna get real specific, there's some literature um, supporting aerobic, there's some literature supporting strength training. Um, some people suggest high intensity aerobic if you can build up to that. Um, and then some people are only going to even tolerate something uh, more calm um, because maybe lighting and other things as far as like yoga or tai chi, um, you know, walking outdoors, we want to be able to handle some sensory input if possible. So, you know, these are ideas that we have. Um, vestibular therapy, just speaking to that, what we do have in the literature usually revolves, I call it care for the whole person. So, you know, uh, what exactly in this is helping the most, we don't know, honestly. But, you know, some measure of strengthening and moving around, some measure of gentle, um, what we call habituation, which means getting people less sensitive to certain sensory inputs. Maybe you can start to be less bothered by those lined shirts someday. Um, so, you know, again, we don't have a lot of parameters. I wish I had more specific advice for physical therapists, except that we usually try to start very light. You know, this is not, let me get aggressive with really fast head movements right out the gate, if that's something that tends to be provoking. Um, and absolutely need to take care of the neck for these patients in my experience. Otherwise, uh, it can be difficult to make good progress. Um, balance issues, I think that's probably the easiest thing to knock out first in a way. We can kind of just work on centering and, you know, getting some strategy using our joints and um, kind of feeling where we are in space with our body a little more and things like that. Um, and so the literature there, you know, there is some support um, if you're willing to be patient. So these patients are going to generally take longer than like someone who's had a peripheral issue, I would say, in general. Um, so you just have to be kind of willing to work with the patient and then maybe spread out their visits. I'll see them once a week and then every other week. And you're nodding your head, which I'm hoping means this is your experience also with what your therapists tell you they're doing or what you've witnessed yourself. Dr. Sharon, is that correct? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um... Absolutely. You know, we should, when we're thinking about vestibular migraine, it has, and migraine in general, it, it, it has a couple different um, sides to it, you know, a, a couple different faces. And, and one of its faces is the sensory hypersensitivity. And sensory hypersensitivity means that things coming in through our different senses, you know, sight and hearing, and, and vestibular and touch and smell are all um, gonna be bothersome um, at levels that don't really bother everyone else. So someone with migraines might be more bothered by lights, might be more bothered by motion, might be more bothered by sounds than someone who doesn't suffer from migraines. And the and by the way, it's it's probably underlies the very common medication sensitivity that we see in this pa patient population as well. It's probably just another arm of this sensory sensitivity. So you're bothered by medication doses that don't bother other people. 
So the motion is a really big one, you know, levels of motion that, uh, meaning vestibular stimulation, vestibular sensory sensitivity, motion that don't bother um, the average person can bother someone with vestibular migraine. So I think the idea of using vestibular physical therapy to try to habituate the brain towards motion and to try to encourage the brain to um, take uh, multi-sensory input and integrate it in a way that isn't bothersome to the patient is, it makes a lot of sense and there's good evidence behind it. Yeah, and the brain is a learning machine. I like to say that to my patients quite often. Um, and it often needs to be paced. And um, that's a big thing. Somebody actually wrote in a question and I thought I could answer it. So I went ahead and did so here, you know, cause they wanted to know how can you settle symptoms if someone's, you know, very dizzy? And, and the short answer of course, is it depends on why they're dizzy, but let's just say they, I, you know, were exposed to some motion that was kind of more than they wanted and it kind of ramped them up or they were in a really busy visual environment and it ramped them up a bit. Some people have found, um, and I can certainly say in clinic, I find this to be true. If I give a patient activity where I know it's going to be a little stimulating for them, that it's really helpful to then, some people call it grounding. You can call it really what you want. I say it's like the little, you know, um, hourglass on the older computer <laughs> programs or say, this just need to catch up. And the brain just needs to process that motion. So you can do it seated, you can do it standing. Sometimes people do kind of a body scan like you would in yoga, you know, feel your head over your center, feel your shoulders over your hips. You're kind of checking in with that body, proprioceptive, somatosensory, whatever you want to call it, information. Um, I call it plugging in sometimes, like you're a plug in a wall. Um, it can be a really nice way, along with kind of locking your vision on a certain object. People uh, talk about ice skaters doing that when they're spinning, right? Just kind of ways to kind of settle the symptoms. It's not a guarantee, um, and certainly, again, depends on the circumstances, but I feel like they're just like a bit ramped up that we can usually bring it back down. Um, and that's the goal. And I tell them that that's a very important piece, that instead of just doing stimulation after stimulation, like, you know, no pain, no gain, like exercise, the brain has to be shaped like clay. You got to just mold it gently with this stuff, especially with this kind of, because you don't want to poke the bear. That's another one of my favorite things to say. Like, you know, you want to get that hypersensitivity where it just gets really ramped up and then it's up for hours. That's not the goal, right? So just a little tip on kind of settling symptoms and kind of helping patients work their way towards this you know this is not necessarily something that could happen uh, quickly you know because we're trying to train the brain and if you want to learn more about that just to let everybody know um anyone can listen to this podcast it's free to all you don't have to be a member of the vestibular special interest group for the apta that's our physical therapy association we did uh, one with myself and sarah oxborough on migraine and meniere's and we talked more about uh, these treatments so anybody who's interested in that feel free um but I wanted to touch on another question that came into us about hormones. Um, so I pulled an article that talks about this. You kind of alluded to biomarkers, which kind of is not the same, but it kind of falls in this category of things we can test, <laughs> um, you know, perhaps with blood tests and things. And I wondered if you have anything to add about this kind of question of how much do hormones play a role in migraine and specifically vestibular migraine? Do we think at some point or even today, are there ways to modulate hormones as a way to help address migraine and reduce vestibular migraine specifically? Yeah, this is an important one. Um, and, um, you know, I think one that in the vestibular community we, we think about, um, I was just having a conversation with a colleague who's a neurologist who specializes in vestibular disorders um, about this issue. Um, it seems pretty clear that there's an interaction there. And, and part of it's just the basic fact that vestibular migraine seems to affect 75 to 80% women versus men. Um, so it's, it's just a lot more um, common and we know for migraine headaches that sometimes they are hormonally driven, uh, meaning um, during the menstrual years, they'll occur at uh, certain times um, as uh, estrogen and progesterone levels are, um, are changing. Um, vestibular migraine, we really haven't gotten into um, trying to treat it as, as much as probably we should have with different hormonal stabilization strategies, meaning trying to change these fluctuations 
and provide stable levels of progesterone and estrogen um, across the month. Um, but um, it's, it's something that we do need to address. It probably doesn't affect all patients. So we probably need a way to identify those in whom it could be playing a role mm -hmm. and then figure out how much different forms of oral contraceptives or other strategies work. Um, one of the issues is no EMT doctor I'm familiar with and EMT doctors and neurologists are generally the two types of doctors who see vestibular migraine patients are comfortable prescribing right. OCPs, oral <laughs> contraceptives. It is not part of our training. Um, and it, we probably would need to do a study and show that it's effective to try to convince people to enter <laughs> this new landscape that they're not familiar with. Right, fair enough. And yeah. even more complex with postmenopausal women, um, because then you're not really talking maybe about birth control. Maybe you'd be talking about hormone replacement therapy. I don't even know. Like, right? Yeah, yeah. And and we probably need better longitudinal studies to just understand um, this. Um, a anecdotally, some people think that, you know, the, the migraines change over the course of the lifespan. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we see that, you know, someone who had really severe headaches um, premenopausally and then postmenopause, it seems to change more to vestibular migraines. Um, uh, when we looked at age distribution of our vestibular migraine population, it's actually pretty constant across the lifespan. Mm -hmm. We don't see a peak at age 50, which is the most common time for menopause, but um, it, you know, probably we need more longitudinal studies looking at um, a whole number of factors. Absolutely. And to mix all this up is the fact that BBVV or benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, little crystals in our inner ear going in the wrong place can mimic vestibular migraine and sometimes coexist with someone who gets vestibular migraine, they will sometimes periodically also get BPPV. I definitely have that group of patients, unfortunate ones that they are. So um, knowing that we always should be checking our patients, doing a good exam, screening them for this. Um, generally, BPV assessment does not take very long, which is great. Um, so you have patients coming in, especially if they're reporting, I roll in bed, I feel dizzy, you know, I sit up. Now, they may not report that because you know, symptom reports definitely widely vary in our mixed populations, in my experience. Also, if they've had a concussion or a brain injury of any kind, they do not always report these kind of classic BBV uh, type uh, reports. Um, so I just, just do your testing. <laughs> That's just my plug. I hope you don't mind, Dr. Sharon. But... No, no, of course. I might throw in one thing here, which yeah. is um, we, did, we did a study um, uh, one of my uh, great med students, Eric Kim, did a study looking at our BPPV population at UCSF. And we divided um, it was several hundred patients who had clear BPPV. And by that, I mean, we leaned them back with their head turned to one side <laughs> and they had the characteristic nystagmus pattern, meaning their eyes jiggle yep. in a certain way that tell us with 100% certainty that was the diagnosis. So no doubt about the diagnosis. Um, and then um, we divided them based on whether or not they had a history of migraine headaches into mm. two groups. And what was interesting was if you have a history of migraine headaches, the age, the average age where you are getting PPV was earlier in life mm. than if you don't have migraine headaches. Mm -hmm. um, and other people have shown um, that, and our study just wasn't able to look at this question, that you're more likely to get BPPV if you have a history of migraine headaches. Right. So my view of this is that migraine uh, may be a risk factor for yeah. BPPV, especially BPPV earlier in life. Most of the time, if I see a patient in their 30s with BPPV, they've got a migraine history, mm -hmm. either that or a really bad head trauma or something else. Right. But usually right. it's a migraine history. Um, so I think that the way migraine affects the inner ear um, can lead to um, just enough irritation of these otoconia that they break free and can cause sometimes a very difficult to treat BBBB. 
Absolutely. No, vascularity is key. So I apologize. There's so much to cover in this article. I'm going to breeze through some of these slides. I hope you all got a chance to read them. But the, the take home for most of this is, you know, whether it's tinnitus or um, kind of this complex way to treat tinnitus. And I just want to say, you know, it was good to see that treating migraine could address tinnitus in the right patients. And uh, with that, looking at hypersensitivity to sound or, you know, kind of hyperacusis, um, you know, strongly severity with the severity of headache um, and can also respond to, you know, treatment of migraine. I think there's a definite theme in this article. Um, not that everyone who has hair hearing symptoms should get migraine meds. I just want to make sure that that's also clear. And you never stated that in the article, but some people might kind of take this too far down the road. Um, but certainly... Um, you know, as far as cochlear migraine, this is where it gets tricky because Meniere's and I just, we had to talk about it. I know some people think that they might be one of the same. Um, just give me your two cents as we kind of get towards the end of our hour here. Yeah. Um, so, um, and, and the, the, that's a perfect setup for me to make one of the points I wanted to make, um, uh, this evening. Um, so half of people who suffer from classic Meniere's disease um, have a history of migraines. And when it it's almost every single vestibular disorder you look at. We talked about BPPV, the loose crystals, connected to migraines. Meniere's disease, connected to migraines. Um, even people who have vestibular hypofunction, their vestibular system stops working, yep. half of them have a migraine history. Um, so it seems... And, th and then the flip side of that is migraine is capable of causing almost every symptom I treat. You know, and you mentioned them, tinnitus, hyperacusis, pressure or fullness in the ear, um, and migraines even related to sudden sensory neural hearing loss. So it seems to me that um, almost everyone, not, not that everyone coming into the clinic has migraines, I'm not saying that, <laughs> No, but everyone with hearing or balance problems should probably be screened for migraines yes. and we should understand whether or not migraine is playing a role um, in their disease. I believe that migraine may be the key uh, to understanding a lot of different vestibular conditions. And if we understand better how migraine affects the ear, maybe then we could have better treatments for things like Meniere's disease or even BPPV. Yes, and if you have someone with sinus pressure, this is a big one, I already hinted at it. I just wanna say, you know, as a physical therapist, I'm not an ENT, I do point patients to ENTs, but on the flip side, uh, some ENTs definitely tend to, if the patient's reporting sinus symptoms, will treat in a sinus manner. And it is worthy of considering this little pie chart that I made that was based off of a lovely lecture that I attended a couple of years ago by Dr. Teixeira and Dr. Carey, uh, who are two excellent aunties that have a great understanding of vestibular migraine, um, to think about what you might see that's in common between the two, like facial pressure and response to decongestants and symptoms that can last for days. Um, and then consider some differences that you could see. And I hope that you kind of agree with this since I took it from your colleagues that I'm sure <laughs> you generally trust, um, you know, to say oh. that we should. Yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And um, you had mentioned uh, the severe migraine and Meniere's disease. And Dr. Teshido has a wonderful talk on YouTube through the uh, house uh, mm -hmm. educational um on, on why the two are related. That's a deep dive into pathophysiology and it's, it's a really nice lecture. Good hint there. All right, so think about that. You mentioned oral fullness and uh, the conclusion of this article was essentially, you know, we need to understand that, you know, you, you can't be shocked if someone has peripheral findings and migraine, because as you mentioned, there might be some sort of some could argue vascular connection there or some kind of pathophysiology that we don't understand yet. Um, so, you know, I think people sometimes like to go to the, is it inner ear or is it brain? And I sometimes say, <laughs> you know, it, it can coexist guys. Like, you know, let's think about, you know, BPPV and migraine can coexist. 
Meniere's and migraine can coexist in some patients. So, you know, think broadly, don't try to get hung up on one single diagnosis as, as nice and clean as that might feel. Um, it's not always that way. So we should really be thinking about migraine on the differential diagnosis for anyone with an audio vestibular complaint. That was kind of your, your overall conclusion. And I reinforced this headache message. So about two thirds, you know, may not report a headache or have a headache during the time of their dizziness attack in vestibular migraine. So this is a lovely summary slide of resources for folks. Um, so, um, Dr. Sharon mentioned he is out at UCSF. If you want to find him there, he is on the medical advisory board of Otolith Labs. And Otolith Labs is doing an active study right now on a very interesting treatment. Um, so if you're a patient or if you're a clinician who wants to learn more about that, I highly recommend checking out their website and seeing if um, you, know, you might want to recommend patients as a clinician, for example, to participate in that study. It should be really uh, a good way to try to learn more about how we can treat patients uh, with, you know, kind of different kinds of dizziness, particular more chronic dizziness um, for that particular uh, treatment approach. And then lots of other tools. So obviously the empathy, the empathy, I'm going to get it. Vempathy, got it. <laughs> get that empathy. Nice. Check that out. Um, and there's a tons of amazing vestibular video patient education resources um, at the UCSF website, which I put the link there for everybody um, that Dr. Sharon had a hand in developing according to that website. And a really cool patient's guide to Meniere's that you also had a hand in developing. Um, I do like to make shortened links with Reed Branley, so I did that a little bit to help people out there. So you can see the shortened link for that there. And then I mentioned that podcast, um, as well as an upcoming course that Vestibular First will be putting out on migraine versus Meniere's uh, kind of a rehab perspective. Um, so we're ready to take a few questions here in our last couple minutes. There we go. All right, so one of the questions is, treatment of vestibular migraine is yet to be found in any of the physician bios I've screened. So this is a question that comes up all the time. How do I find a doctor that feels comfortable treating vestibular migraine where I live if I don't live near Dr. Sharon? <laughs> <laughs> um, oh boy, that's a good question. Um, so, um, you know, we don't have a big list of um, kind of vestibular providers, right? Um, generally, they come in two flavors. Um, it's either going to be a neurologist who um, specializes in vestibular disorders, and a lot of people call that an otoneurologist, and then or an ENT who um, specializes in vestibular disorders, and a lot of times we call that a neurotologist. Um, so generally speaking, um, you want to try to find uh, someone like that. Um, but it, 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 we probably do need some like, you know, guide to, um, to different ones all around. Um, and I, I'm not aware that there is one. Um, one option is I think Vita, the vestibular.org website does maintain um, a list of providers, but I, I don't believe that it's um, entirely comprehensive. Um, but that, that may be one place to start. In the northern uh, Virginia area, um, uh, you know, it, it depends how much you want to drive. Um, I did some of my training at Hopkins. I'm not going to lie, I'm a little partial to them. You know, uh, they, and obviously there are some excellent both otoneurologists, meaning neurologists who specialize in vestibular disorders, and also neurotologists there who, um, who are great at treating uh, vestibular migraine. Um, Dr. Uh, Teshido's practice, he was mentioned before, he's a vestibular migraine uh, national expert and his practice is in Delaware. And I'll just tack on, I'm aware that Shin Bay does telehealth out of Texas, I believe he's located. So some patients have actually had really good experiences. Um, you know, it's a little more coordination, I think sometimes, but um, telehealth is certainly an option if you really have a complicated case, especially I feel like 
Um, he wrote a book, <laughs> um, Victory Over Vestibular Migraine, and um, he's pretty knowledgeable, I would say, if you would agree with that, Dr. Sharon. So another question here. Can you go over how long, how an aura presents, how long, how soon it presents prior to migraine, and can it manifest in other ways besides visually? Oh, that's a lot. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. So it's important to know that not everyone with migraines gets an aura. Um, but um, a, a percentage does. It's actually a minority, but a, a percentage does. An aura is defined as a reversible neurologic um, symptom set um, that can present um, either by itself or at the beginning of um, uh, a migraine. Um, the most common aura, meaning the most common um, type of neurologic activity that's going on uh, with the migraines is visual, but it can be other things, um, meaning it could be uh, a sensory thing or some uh, it smell that you have or something like that. Um, so I will tell you that um, I um, have ne not had migraine headaches but I actually have had a couple of migraine auras. So I'll tell you about my auras um, by way of describing them. Um, and I'll tell you that because I time them and mine all are usually about 14 minutes. Um, hmm. So usually what happens for an aura is it, it has to be reversible. Um, and usually there's some sort of change that's going on in how um, the brain activity and therefore what you're experiencing. Um, so uh, for mine, I saw this kind of like flashing a uh, light sort of circular circular pattern. Um, and it would start in one area of my vision and then it would get bigger and go across diagonally um, from the bottom left to the top right. Um, and it just kept doing that <laughs> over and over and over again. So my um, patients think for, they're crazy also. <laughs> uh, 14 minutes. Well, if you don't know what it is, um, and I guess for me, the ironic thing was it happened well after I decided to try to study my brains with my <laughs> career. Um, so maybe it's just the grand irony of the universe. If you don't know what it is, it's terrifying and you probably think you're having a stroke. Um and probably the first time you have an aura, it does make sense to just make sure that you're not having a stroke. Sure. Um, but, you know, an aura um, will will reverse. Um, and usually it's going to last more in that, you know, 15 to 20 minute range. Right. And this brings us to another question that I had gotten uh, before this talk in an email, which was, um, you know, in acute care or a hospital or even a home health setting, any like couple of tips for a clinician to maybe watch out for or what they should do if a patient's kind of reporting something that would make them think, you know, you know, migraine, should I worry at stroke? What are your thoughts on that? You have to be careful, right? Um, and there's always like this, um, you know, cyclical nature pattern we have with the diagnosis. You know, we start seeing vestibular migraine come into the literature maybe in like, you know, 2000 or so. Um, and then it, it starts getting widespread more at least um, acceptance, maybe even 10 years ago, not more. Um, and then there, there usually is a period of like overdiagnosis with things um, that you have to be careful for. Right. Um, I think that's going on now with 3PD. Yeah. Um, and, then, and then things settle back to um, where, where they should be. Um, so I've definitely seen patients um, who have other conditions that were um, that were either coexisting with vestibular migraine or um, or were there instead of the vestibular migraine. So um, I guess there's a couple red flags, right? Um, one big red flag for me is frequent falls. Um, I think frequent falls is something we all have to ask about. And if you're having frequent falls, it's it's more likely um, that you uh, have some other condition um, than vestibular migraine. And you need uh, a neurologist um, or a neurologist or someone else to examine you for um, neurologic diseases um, that can cause frequent falls, meaning you know problems with your cerebellum, cerebellar degeneration, 
neurologic diseases like Parkinson's disease um, or, um, or other conditions. Fair enough. All right, we have time for one more question. Um, can Botox treat vestibular migraine? A quick answer on that. I am going to say the same thing that I've been saying all evening. Um, it's a great question, right? Because Botox is a, uh, uh, effective treatment for chronic, um, migraine, right? Um, we don't actually know, is it a good treatment for vestibular migraine or not? It's probably something that needs to be formally studied. From my patients, because there's a lot of patients who have overlap, meaning they have chronic migraines and chronic vestibular migraines, um, it doesn't seem like Botox is the most effective treatment for vestibular migraine, but it may, similar to migraine headaches, if you do a big enough study, we might find that it's effective for some patients. Right. The, um, I should probably mention, you know, I've spent a lot of the last few years trying to do a study on the CGRP medications mm -hmm. for vestibular migraine. And um, we don't have results yet, but there was an Italian study um, that had a single arm that said that injectable medicines for CGRP, so the trade names are like Amavig and Galati, HIV, um, are pretty effective for vestibular migraine. And that mirrors our experience where, unfortunately, no medicine is effective for 100% of people, but we have been having good success with those medications. So that's probably the group of medications that at this point in time, I'm most excited about for vestibular migraine. Awesome. All right. Everyone else who put in a question, I promise I will get a, an answer. I will put answers in the YouTube comment section and I'll try if I have your individual emails, which I should because you probably registered. If you did register for this event, I'll make sure I email you the answers. I will get answers direct from Dr. Schrone. Um, I will email him all of our questions and get them all back uh, with answers. So thank you guys for listening. Fantastic to have you, Dr. Sharon, with your excellent expertise and your commitment to research. Um, keep it up. It's amazing. And we really appreciate your time and efforts. My pleasure. All right. Everyone have a good night. We'll see you in June for more Journal Clubs with Vestibular First. Mm. All right. <laughs>